Good evening. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is John Weinstein. I am the provost and vice president here at Bard College at Simons Rock and very excited to welcome you, whether you're here in the theater with us or in our viewing audience beyond, to the Book One 2023 lecture. So welcome. Inaugurated in 2005, the Book One program asks members of the incoming class to read the first book of their general education program and their college careers. Each year, a book is selected based on its excellence and suitability for promoting interdisciplinary conversations about the intersections of cultures. The author visits the campus to enrich the students' appreciation of the book and to give incoming students, as well as the entire Simons Rock community, to ask questions of the author, which is something that you'll get to do this evening. But before we get to our speaker, I would like to introduce the introducer of our speaker. I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague, Professor Jennifer Brody. Um, Jennifer is a professor of literature, very widely put. I know for many years, there will be a course that Jennifer offers on a new thing that we don't yet know is a literary genre. And then it soon becomes, or not so soon becomes something that becomes an established form and a household name. So I remember when she first taught a course on blogs, I didn't know what a blog was. Clearly they went somewhere, right? So um, I think her, you know, her, her passion for different areas comes through in her work on contemporary world literature by women, women and gender studies, journalism, media studies, digital media studies, autobiography, memoir, environmental writing, among many others. So I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Jennifer Brody. Also very short, I have to pull this down. So tonight I have the pleasure of introducing Mira Jacob, whose graphic memoir, Good Talk, we read as this year's book one, which is, as John said, the first book that our incoming students encounter together. Book one was, a Good Talk was a wonderful pick for book one because it takes us quickly and deeply onto the intimate terrain of family and cultural dynamics that are at once personal and unique to Mira and her family, and also universal enough so that most of us can recognize ourselves in aspects of her story. For me, the story hit home in many ways. I grew up in New York City, and although I was here at Simon's Rock on the morning of 9-11, Mira's description of that day took me right back to the shock and horror that everyone felt as we watched the footage of those planes hitting the World Trade Center towers. And then the aftermath of reactionary American racism against Muslims, all wrapped up in oversized patriotic American flags, was also horrifying and poignantly documented in Good Talk. The exploration of racism is paramount in this book, which begins with Mira fielding questions from her young biracial son as he tries to understand the implications of the undercurrents of difference that he senses in the people around him, including his own parents. As a white person of Jewish heritage who married and had children with a brown Mexican, Mira's description of the complexities of navigating racial difference within families felt completely true and more than a little raw to me. The honesty with which she portrayed her Indian grandmother's racism was searing. As a memoirist myself, this was one of the places I found hard to talk about, the racism or homophobia or sexism within my family and my husband's family. It's such a sensitive topic that it's tempting when you're trying to write about your family to give it a wide berth, to go around it. But in good talk, Mira does the opposite. She takes us there from page one and follows the trail tenaciously, trying to understand and to help her readers understand that even within loving families, cultural racism can cut deep and leave lasting wounds. I was impressed that she was willing to show us a moment when she herself unintentionally committed a racist microaggression against an African-American friend. By going there and sharing her own life experience, Mira encourages us to open up too and underlines how important it is for us to be honest with ourselves and others about how complicated inherited cultural stereotypes can emerge and color our interactions even when we have no intention at all of hurting someone else. <clears throat> in calling her memoir Good Talk, Mira Jacob 
emphasizes how important it is to have more good conversations about these complex, convoluted aspects of our lives. Talking with our children, our parents, our extended families and friends, with anyone and everyone who's willing to listen with an open mind and heart and engage on a deep, true level. Mira shows us that by engaging in this practice of good talk, seeking to heal old wounds and strengthen new relationships across difference, we will emerge stronger as individuals and as a collective, as a community, a society, a country, and a world. It's not too much to say that our future depends on the caliber of our good talks with each other. And I'm so grateful to Mira Jacob for decisively opening up the terrain for us by sharing her own experience so honestly. So I'm very excited for our conversation tonight. I know the students in my workshop and seminar section have some questions, and I'm sure that others do as well. But before I turn it over to Mira, I want to briefly share that Good Talk was shortlisted for the National Book Critics Circle Award, longlisted for the Penn Open Book Award, named a New York Times Notable Book, as well as a Best Book of the Year by Time, Esquire, Publishers Weekly, and Library Journal. It's currently in development as a television series. Her earlier novel, The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing, was a Barnes & Noble Discover New Writers pick and named one of the best books of 2014 by Kirkus Reviews, The Boston Globe, Goodreads, Bustle, and The Millions. Her work has appeared in the New York Times Book Review, Tin House, Vogue, and many other publications. She's currently a visiting professor in the MFA Creative Writing Program at the New School in New York and a founding faculty member of the MFA program at Randolph College. As co-founder of Pete's Reading Series in Brooklyn, she spent 13 years bringing literary fiction, nonfiction, and poetry to Williamsburg. And we are so fortunate to have her here with us tonight. So please join me in welcoming Mira Jacob. Hey y'all, can you hear me? How are you guys doing? Yeah, all right. Um, okay, I'm gonna switch to this in one second, but um, so I can read to you a little bit from this book, but here's how this is gonna go. I'm gonna read to you a little bit from this book. Um, I think uh, one of the chapters at least is one that I know you've discussed. Um, and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this process that I went to to write this book, because one of the things that happened to make this book, um, one of the things that I had to do to make this book, I should say, is I had to really turn a corner and learn a bunch of things I didn't know how to do, like draw and learn how to use all the software that you have to do to design a book and make a font and, and, and. And I think, and why I like to tell you guys that is because I think sometimes when you're starting something huge, like a project, you can get really overwhelmed. Has anyone ever done that? You like start a thing and in the middle you're like, okay, enough. I've done like five seconds of that and that's enough. And the beautiful dream that I thought I was gonna have is no longer having, and it's no longer happening for me. No one's ever done that. Yeah, okay, all right. Like, thank God. I'm like, no, my people are not here. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, so that thing, I always think about that. Like, what is the difference between starting something and being able to sustain it and starting something and then realizing that it's sort of um, it's overwhelming and you walk away from it, but you've got this kind of burning desire to have it, but you can't quite get there. And for me, that thing was taking it one step at a time and learning what I needed to know as I went. So just to tell you how this book started, it's really the first chapter of the book. My son was six. He was obsessed with Michael Jackson. Um, I look like me. My husband is white and Jewish. He came home, he had a lot of questions. Some of those questions were very cute. Like what happened to his other glove, which frankly is not something I'd ever thought of. Um, or do people, is that how people walk on the moon? Which again, I was like that, you know, there's some, there's some good six-year-old thoughts that are happening there. Um, but then some of them were harder. It was 2014. There was a lot going on. There was an uprising going on in Ferguson. There was a lot happening in the news. There was a lot that he was picking up on and at one point, what we'd done is we'd given him all the albums, all the actual record albums, thinking, I was thinking, by the way, that I was a genius. I was like, he won't be able to skip the songs. We'll listen to all of them. It'll be beautiful. And what happens if you give a little kid a bunch of Michael Jackson albums, which are pretty big, right? Like a record album is like this big. 
Kid goes into his room alone for hours staring at these things. He comes back with what is, I guess, kind of an obvious question, which is, is Michael Jackson, is he brown or white? I was like, yeah. Mm. And I said, well, you know, he's, um, so he's, he's brown, um, he's black and his skin is brown. And then what happened is, so he kind of, well, he turned white. <laughs> and he goes, he turned white? And I said, yeah. And he goes, are you going to turn white? And I was like, no, I'm not going to turn white. And he was like, am I going to, am I going to turn white? And I was like, no, you're not going to turn white. And he's like, what about daddy? And I said, but daddy's already white. And he goes, but was he always? And it was this horrible moment. I'm sure all of your parents have been through this, but when you're like, oh no, I broke my child. Like no one should have given me one of these in the first place. And I definitely am not doing well with this. Um, and it was, it was one of those moments though, also where I realized oh no, this is more complicated than I thought. And something I thought was going to be really simple to explain to him is actually kind of difficult. And his questions about Michael Jackson got way more advanced very quickly. So he wanted to know what Michael Jackson liked better. Did he like being brown or white better? Did he, um, there was one time when we were on a subway going home and, and like into that space. Have you all been on a New York subway? Who here has been on a New York subway? All right, who here's been on a New York subway at the end of work hours? So like, so, okay, yeah. So you know how everybody sort of smells bad and doesn't talk to each other? It's just that space where everyone's like, I'm not doing this, you're not a human, I'm not a human, nothing about us is going to connect. So into that really weird fetid air, he goes, um, what did he say? He's like, are, are white people afraid of brown people? Like, and it pierced the whole subway. And I was like, oh no. And everyone turned and looked at us and I had this moment where I just, I clocked everyone that was looking at us, right? Cause I clocked like, I clocked the hipster white teenagers that were across from us and just felt really sad. They were sad and they were like, oh God. And they were giving me the, I am so sorry, your child has to ask you this question face. And I was giving them the, yeah, I know it sucks face. And then there was this man of indeterminate race sort of next to me who was frowning at me. And I was like, oh man, what's his stake in this? And there was a black woman standing right next to me. I was like, mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, so we're, you know, there's a lot of people that had opinions. And then there's me, the mom, who doesn't want to lie to my kid, right? So, and the reason I didn't want to lie to my kid, I should back up and tell you, is because my parents were Indian. They came here in the late 60s. Whenever I tried to ask them about things that were happening to me that felt what we would just call a kind of garden variety racist now, um, they were like, no, that's not happening. No, it's fine. Nothing's happening. So I didn't want to do that with him. I didn't want him to lose trust in me. So what I ended up saying to him in that moment was, are white people afraid of brown people sometimes? And somehow that was the wrong answer for everybody. Like everybody who was looking at us looked so pained and I felt so pained. I also knew I wasn't lying to him, but sometimes the truth is really heavy and you have a six-year-old. And I also was like, when's the right time to tell him this? Like, when's the right time to say that? And then um, that night when I was putting him to bed, I was, I was tucking him in and just out of the blue, he's like, is daddy afraid of us? And again, like the same thing. And my immediate reaction was to say, no, no, of course not. What? No. But I knew where he got that from. I knew why he was asking. And I also knew the answer wasn't so simple. Is his dad afraid of us? No. Are other people? Yes. How do you know the difference? I don't know. Right? I don't know what to tell you. And that's what he asked too. It's like, how do you know which ones are afraid of you? I don't know. And that also felt like a really hard thing to have to say to a kid. So I did that. And then I did the thing that you do in New York when you need privacy, which is that I went and sat in the bathroom um, alone and just sort of like shook, right? For a while. I just, because I understood that this that all this information was going into his head and he saw things. And you guys remember, right? Like, I'm sure you've had moments where people are like, you're not going to know that until we're ready for you to know that. And you figure it out like five years ahead of whenever they told you, right? So you know things. And I knew he knew things and that I wasn't necessarily going to be able to make sense of all of it for him because I didn't know how to make sense of it for myself. So the next day, he goes to school and what I'm used to doing with that information, I should tell you, because I'm a writer, I wrote, I write essays, um, I wrote a, a novel, I'm used to writing, I'm used to using the words. But what had happened 
in the last few years is every time I wrote something about anything like that, it was just a wall of people that would, you know, slide into my DMs and tell me all the ways they were going to kill me, which is kind of the hazard of the job. I know that. Also, though, really scary to have that coming at you when you've got your kid involved. And I kind of froze up and I didn't know what to do. And so the next day, I was trying to write the paragraph and it wasn't working. Because every time, because I will just say, like, when you're used to making a, a bridge with words, and then suddenly you realize that every word you use is kindling coming back for you, it's like a fire they're going to light on you, you just lock up. And so I went and I, um, first of all, I, I, I drew us on paper, like these little paper puppets almost. And then I went to his room and I got out the Michael Jackson albums and I laid them right across my dining room table. And then I, I took the paper cutouts of us and I put them on and then I started trying to recreate the, the conversation we had had, all the things he'd been asking me. And I just kept writing it down on paper and cutting them out into the cartoon bubbles and putting them on the albums and then standing on my dining room table, which I don't recommend, um, and taking a picture and then cropping the picture and seeing what it looked like and then making the next one. And when I was done, I felt like I had something. Like it was the first time I felt like I really had something. Like I had something that was actually getting to the thing I was trying to say, but it wasn't doing the, the most scary part. It wasn't doing the part that I was most terrified of. Um, and it was, it was offering me a way forward. So that's how the book started. And I'm going to read you a couple chapters from it, and then we're going to have a QA. and um, You guys can ask me anything. I'm just going to tell you so you can be thinking about it while I'm reading all the things you can ask me about. You can ask me about if anyone in here is a writer and has big writing dreams. You can ask me anything about writing. You can ask me about the business of writing. You can ask me about race and my family. You can ask me about... Um, how it's going now. You can ask me about what do you do with your tender heart in these times. I am open for everything. Um, the only thing that I'll preemptively say to you is that I did not solve racism. So I'm not going to be able to help us with that. But short of that, we can talk about everything, okay? Um, can we switch to this mic? Hello? Yeah. All right. Let me see where I should read from. One sec. Can you all see if I do this? Yeah? Okay. Can you see? Yeah? Okay. Wait, hold on. One small thing to tell you. You're going to hear me speaking in the accents of my parents. My parents have Indian accents. I don't speak in an Indian accent because I think it's a hilarious accent. I speak in it because that's actually how my parents talk. And if I make them sound like white people, it really freaks me out. So that's coming. Chapter 13, American Love. According to my parents, there were two basic kinds of marriage, arranged marriage and love marriage. And then there was American love. Mom, if someone asked you to define arranged marriage, what would you say? Good. That's it? What? It's a good marriage for Indians. Okay, and now define love marriage. A marriage in which the two were not arranged. Aren't you forgetting something? No. Yes, you are. Indians. You're forgetting it's only for Indians. Fine. So what's American love? Passion, scandal, affairs, slinky outfits, Elizabeth Taylor, Dallas, the Morgans, the Parkers, the Lees. Now you're just yelling out the names of friends who got divorced. The McLaughlins, the Wilsons. My parents had theories on successful marriages. The problem with these Americans is they're always saying, you're not well married and getting divorced. Indians never do this. Why not? Because we never knew who we married in the first place. Lots of theories. When you have more in common, you have less to worry about. Not that who you marry is up to us. No, you do what you want. None of our business. I'm sure the mixed marriages can work out too sometimes. But it's hard, I think, for the kids. By my early 20s, all of this lived in a pretty strange place in my head. Welcome to the mating game. A friend of your, your great-aunt's son 
he loves long nights indoors, weekends at your parents' house, and staying married no matter what. Say hello to bachelor number one. Looking to blend seamlessly into America while feeling more alone than ever in your soul, here's bachelor number two. Born there but raised here, this young man comes with just enough friction to keep things interesting, understands parts of you that you thought no one ever would, and is rumored to exist. Bachelor number three, are you there? Luckily, my brother had all the same issues I did, was equally committed to poor dating choices, and lived 15 minutes away from me in Seattle. One of us was always breaking up with someone or getting broken up with by someone. What happened? She sucks. My brother had a type. Blonde, athletic, wrong for him. I mostly remembered them by their undoings. The one who didn't like his friends. The one who was competitive about everything. He turned my exes into country western song titles. He said I would understand if I were a real writer. Psh, mopey poet, why'd you blow it? He told me that beer for breakfast is normal? Uh, could have been your lover if you would have had a liver. And then he tried to tell me they were mine. Those weren't your panties, but that was your heart. The good part about communal sibling heartache is that you can get a certain kind of clarity. It's just that we're too kind and mature for everyone, and we need to wait until they catch up to the very high level we're operating at. Should we fill the pain with pizza? Yes. And even when that clarity wears off, you still have your sibling. It's our parents' fault. Do you think they even love each other? Why would you ever make me think about that? So when Arun became really excited about a new woman, after hanging out a few times, it felt different. I mean it. I think she's it. After a month, ha. Maybe it's the Indian thing. Wait, what? She's, oh my god. You're going to ruin my life. What? You're already Mr. Perfect Likes Math and Science. Now you want to be Mr. Perfect Likes Math and Science and Indian women? No. But I'm not trying to be perfect. Oh, shut up. Even more perfect. I thought it wouldn't work out. That maybe it would go away out of the blue like it did with the one who suddenly went back to dating women. But then I met Lopa and saw how they shared some deep core values. One, they were equally chill about tradition. Two, they believed dogs were better than people, because they are. Three, treated parents like well-meaning interlopers from another planet. At the wedding, my parents wandered around like lost children from a fairy tale whose home had come and found them. You look so happy. It's so wonderful. I can't believe it. And what about you, Mira? You've met somebody? Nope. Don't wait too long. Nothing good comes of it. Yep. We think our hearts break only from the endings. The love gone. The room's empty the future unhappening as we stand ready to step into it. But what about how they can shatter in the face of what is possible? Okay, so the next one I'm going to read you is my dad's birthday today. I know! So I realized that um, when I was driving here, and I was really just going to read you this one, but in honor of my dad, I hope you guys are cool with me reading you one more, yeah? All right. Summer on the television. Growing up, I thought American parents, the really cool ones anyway, smoked weed with their kids. That did not happen. My parents were insanely strict. So you guys only got high on holidays? Sometimes, when I was feeling bad about having parents who would never really understand me, I would lie in bed imagining all the epiphanies the stoned American families around us were having. Dad, I really just don't want to be a doctor. You know, I think I only wanted that for you because my own childhood, my, sorry, my own childhood, my own upbringing, um, 
Sorry, I can't read it because it's a little blurry there. I'm oh, sorry, because my own childhood was filled with so much instability, but I get it. Be a musician. Want some ice cream? In terms of understanding my life choices, my parents were pity epiphany free. Being a writer isn't a real job. Do something that gives you stability. You can always write on the side. She's right. You have to be able to support your children. I don't even want children. You have to want children. Recurring Parental Conversation, 1984 to 2003. The year after I got married, the Recurring Parental Conversation stopped. Mira, I have the cancer. No. Yes. It's okay. It's going to be okay. Bad. My dad getting cancer was not okay. It was not okay the first year with the first surgery and the third year and the sorry and by the third year and second surgery and the fifth round of chemo it was really not okay. Eat one chapati, just one. You're wasting away. I can't. Dad, have you tried smoking weed? Are you nuts? The drugs will kill him. Thing you didn't imagine doing <laughs> in your twenties, thirties. House of the guy everyone thought everyone bought weed from in high school. Hey, uh, is uh, Dave still here? My name is Cooper. I am six. That's fantastic. Goodbye forever, Cooper. Thing you did not imagine doing ever. Um, hey, it's Mira. I was wondering if you guys knew where I could get some. Uh, it's for my dad. Side note, weed, extremely illegal when this was happening. Do you guys know that? Yeah, extremely illegal. Um, guy who was always high in school. Dude, seriously? That one guy you went on a date with. Wait, who is this? One of the carpool moms. You betcha, come on over, honey. <laughs> we love the carpool moms, right? <laughs> They're the best. The first time I brought weed home, it did not go well. Oh my God, you know the drug dealers. Who saw you do this? The FBI will come. You will get arrested. Do you want to get us arrested? What kind of child are you? Your mother cannot go to jail for a crime she did not commit. I will not let that happen. Mrs. Reed gave it to me for you. Mrs. Reed doesn't. Yeah, she does. No. It's going to be OK. Mira. Getting my dad high wasn't easy at first. Absolutely not. It'll help you eat. No. Nope. If you eat, mom will be happy. Give it to me. This is your dad on drugs, day one. Can I have a little more rice? Yes. Yes. Uh, what else? Do you have ice cream? Nobody move. I'm going to buy ice cream. This is your dad on drugs, week two. Do you know what is so funny? My old friend Charles comes to see me every day at 4.20, and you know what he wants to do? I can guess. This is your dad on drugs, month three. Can you believe this Google Earth? It's a miracle. I can sit here in my chair and fly pushroom anywhere in the whole world. I went to the Grand Canyon and the Forbidden City all in one night. What a time to be alive. What a beautiful life. Dad. What? Nothing. One night, my dad finally asked, you want some? What? Really? I almost didn't do it because it wasn't really in character with what I knew of him. But then neither was dying of cancer. We got high. <laughs> We ate chips and ice cream and peanut brittle. We watched TV. We laughed loudly and for too long at everything. A commercial came on with an old man <clears throat> driving a little, um, a little boy in a dark red sports car. It was summer on the television. It was winter outside. Something popped into my mind, not quite clear, but on the periphery, something I would understand if I turned and looked at it directly. I turned and looked at my dad, and he said it. I'll never know your children.
two years after my dad died, I had a son. Sorry, it's his birthday. <laughs> yeah, okay. Two years after my dad died, I had a son. Three years after that, I finished my first novel. Did Uppa like your book? He died before I finished it, so he didn't get to read it. Can you carry me? Kids are amazing. Hey, I have an idea. How about if we get all the pages and put them on the stoop, and when a big wind comes, it will blow them up into heaven, and Uppa can read your book, and it will be really beautiful. What do you think? Dad. What? Nothing. Great idea. OK, thanks. Are we going to do our Q&A? Should we do that? Are we doing that now? OK, great. Um, thank you. And I just want to, I invoked the spirit of my dad. And so I actually felt, I felt him for a minute. Do you guys ever do that? Like you miss somebody and you feel him a little bit? So I felt him. And it, by the way, he's a very good spirit. So if he's in here with us, bring it on. All right. So we got plenty of time for questions if anyone has them. So I'll try to help spot because the lights are coming this way. So the yep. lights aren't quite in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, such a good question. So I'm just going to repeat it. So um, in terms of, so when I was growing up, a lot of people um, told me that I could only expect so much from my life because I was dark skinned. And you are facing the same thing with diet culture and with what people tell you are your possibilities. And how does it affect me? How does those limitations affect me now? Um, it's a really good question, and I'm glad you asked it. So one thing that I was raised with is I didn't actually know until I was five that all of India thought that I was too dark. And before then, I had lived in this bubble of just being me. And when we came back to America, my parents tried to put me back in that sort of, in that place of like, you, you're good, you're okay, this is good, you're yourself. And what they realized is you can't put that, like you can't put someone back into the safe space once they've been kind of exposed to that kind of thinking. So the next thing that, that we had to do and that I really had to do and figure out was how do, how do I just be, how do I just become myself without their limited idea of who I, who I can be. There's one kind of amazing side effect of that, which is I didn't publish my first book until I was 40. I had been writing for 20 years trying to publish a novel. I think most people would have given up. I knew because I had had to imagine myself in a way that nobody around me could imagine me. I had to imagine what my actual possibilities were and they were never their limited possibilities for me. It was so far beyond that, that it gave me an incredible amount of resistance and resilience to what other people thought of me. But I will tell you, the road there was rocky and it's still, there are still times when it hits me, when I feel, when I feel like the weight of that judgment um, every time I go to India, any man who meets me says in this way, he's like, you're very confident as a, why would you possibly be? And I know, I know why they think that. And I also know who I am and what I'm capable of. So it's a constant dance between actualizing myself and taking all the, all the things I learned and like keeping myself together. And occasionally when I get knocked back saying, yeah, that was going to happen because by design, this is by design that these things are happening. It's not because you have tender feelings and are making a big deal out of something. It's because you're getting a bad message every day that has nothing to do with you. And the only thing I can say that makes it easier is when you can spot the message. And you're like, that's that message. I see, what you, I see what that is, and I see what it's designed to do. It's designed to make someone like me expect less and disappear. Don't disappear. Right? That's what you've got. That's the part that you've got. Um, who else? Yeah, right in front.
Ja. Yeah, okay, so he is 14. Um, and so we had, so, uh, so when I wrote this book, there's a point in time when I, when I realized what it was going to be about. By the way, I just want you to know, I didn't set out to write this book. I thought I was going to write a hilarious book, a hilarious book about identity in America. Um, and then, and then my, and then America started going down a very dark passage that we're, we're very much in. And my in-laws became very avid Trump supporters. And I had been, at that point, they'd been my in-laws for 16 years, right? So that's a lot. That's a lot of, that's a lot to lose. And so when I realized what the book was really going to be, I remember I woke up one time in the middle of the night and I, I was crying because I realized what was going to happen. And my, and my um, partner woke up and he's like, what's going on? I was like, if I write the book, if I write the truth, it's going to explode our family. It's going to get bad. And to his credit, he's also an artist. He's a documentary maker. Um, he said, you can't worry about that right now. You have to write. I'm not going to, like, I can't sit here and tell you what to write. If you want to make my parents into some monsters, then, you know, you've got a lot to work with there. And I was like, I'm, and he's like, you know, you can tell all sorts of lies about them if you wanted to. And I was like, do you think I would do that? I'm not worried about lying about your parents. I'm worried about telling the truth about them. That's the part that's going to be hard. And he said, well, that... I would never stand in the way of that. So we knew that, and the next part was, what do we do about our son? What do we do about protecting him? What does it mean to have this be our family history? Everyone else in the family, they didn't get to have a say on, um, on what conversations, what appeared in here or not. I sent them the book when it's in galleys. Do you guys know what galleys are? Galleys are basically when the book is almost done, you get a kind of a, a, a rough draft, and it comes out and it's bound. And the reason I sent it to them like that is because it looked like a finished book. I'll tell you now that if someone had come to me and said, oh my God, absolutely not, what have you done? I would have had a conversation with them about it. Nobody did that. The one person who was allowed to reject anything was my son. Because he was six when, he, when I started it. He was eight when I finished it. Because it's his life. And the way that, the, so what I told him at the time was, I'm going to read you this book, because he couldn't read. Um, I'm going to read you this book. I'm going to read you the things that I said in here, and these are the conversations as I remember them. If any of them feel funny to you, you don't have to explain why. It's done. It's gone. We don't have to we don't have, to have a bigger conversation about that. Because I didn't want him to have to explain it, because also, like, that's a lot. Um, it's very funny because what would happen in the course also of writing the book is he would say these hilarious things and then uh, and then I would write them down. And at first, like the first time I'd read it to him, he'd be like, okay. And the second time he'd be like, did I say that? You know, and I was like, yeah, you did. You said it last week. Come on. Um, and then the third time I would read it to him, he'd be like, I'm so funny. You know? <laughs> so um, when, so that there's that part of it where he could reject anything. But the other part of it, honestly, is you put a book like this out in the world. He's very recognizable. I, I also thought about not drawing him looking like himself, but um, I tried that and it made him very sad. So I was like, no, okay, I'll draw you as yourself in here. But he's very recognizable as a result. When we would go, we would be in Brooklyn and I would be doing another performance or reading or something. Um, sometimes people would come up to him almost always white people and say, oh, you're the kid about the Michael Jackson stuff. Say that thing about, say that thing about our white people afraid of brown people. And I, it was awful. He told me about it. I saw him once in a bookstore just with this look on his face where he was like, like just looking and I was, and I said, what happened there? And he told me and I said, look, I couldn't get all of you into this book. No one can do that in a book. A book, a book like by necessity is a flattener. I couldn't get the complexity of you in the book. I put one version of you in the book. If people want you to reenact that version of yourself, something is wrong with them, and you just walk away. You don't even have to say, excuse me. And he goes, you don't have to say, excuse me? I was like, no, you just walk. And so the next time we were at an event and that happened, I watched it. I watched it happen. I watched these people lean over him, and I just watched him go. <laughs> and he came back, and he was like, mom, I did it. Um, so that's, so that's generally how that conversation went. I will also say he's 14. I imagine at some point he's going to be upset. He has every right to be. 
when I wrote the book, the thing that I told him is whatever comes up, it's my job to keep talking to you about it. If you're pissed, it's my job to tell you my reasoning and take whatever, whatever anger you have. Um, but that's because he's my kid. I will not do that for anyone else, but I will definitely do that for him. These days, I mean, I'm probably, I'm sure he's like all of you. I think he's worried about what is coming up with the election. And I think he, he feels like there is a much better world to be had if his generation can get a hold of it. So, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Yes. Okay. So those are two big choices. So I'm going to just repeat that. So one is, was there any problems with the publishing company with trying to publish a book that is so critical? Is that what you said? Okay. And the other is, what about the stylistic choices? I'm going to do the stylistic choices first, and I'm probably going to ask you what the first question is, because I usually forget the first question when I'm answering the second. But I absolutely, um, part of the, the reason I made that stylistic choice is um, in terms of the black and white one thing that I think is really interesting about having all the people of color show up in black and white is that you realize how not different it is, right? It's, a, it's like a shade. It's amazing, by the way, when you're drawing and you're, doing, you're using a black and white palette and you're trying to show the difference between a brown person and a white person, it literally is the tiniest little bit of difference. Also, just, just in terms of how the visual works, it keeps that character from blending into the background. And that's what I was really thinking about, bodies and space and how does that work? And how do our bodies in, react in environments and why do we separate from them? So that's sort of the visualization of that for me. The face thing, you know, they don't change, they never change their expressions, right? It's just like a, a face that stays the same. Um, and this ties into the second question, which I do remember, by the way, which is, was it hard to do a book that was critical? My first editor, was a white man in his 30s and he bought the book i mean god bless him for buying the book because i hadn't uh drawn a book before and was in fact teaching myself how to draw as i was writing this book and like really nice of them to be like we believe you can do this great but when i started drawing it um immediately he said you know though you're doing this thing with the faces they're all just sort of frozen it's just the same face and i said yeah on purpose and he said why Okay, remember the part where I told you that it was really hard for me to write the nonfiction essay because every time I tried to write it, all I could imagine was all the wall of hate coming toward me? Has anyone here ever, here ever tried to explain a racist incident that's happened to them and they're not believed? Yeah? Like you do it, right? You, start, you try to say what's happened and someone doesn't believe you. What do you do in that moment when someone doesn't believe you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. I will say that's uh, those are all very, very good, solid ways to handle it. I will tell you what I do in that situation. Just the truth of what I do is I panic. Like the fact that they don't believe me panics me. And then I start talking louder and I start Sometimes I get really frustrated. Sometimes I cry. Sometimes like I shout. It just, it's overwhelming for me. And the thing that I hate most about it is that I feel like I'm trying to convince somebody of what my reality is instead of being able to just have a conversation about it. I'm suddenly in a place where I'm like fighting for it and I'm performing my emotions for them. So it's like, they're like, well, you don't seem that that was that scary for you. You seem fine now. And I'm like, no, I was scared. I am scared. And then I'm, I'm basically trying to make somebody believe something that they don't want to believe in the first place. They have a lot of re reasons for not wanting to believe it in the first place. The reason I kept the characters' faces the way they are, which is that they're, they're blank, right? They're almost like a, a flat face. They can be saying anything. I didn't know it at the time, but when I did it, it felt like the opposite of, this, of the thing that, that you do when you're trying desperately to get someone to understand you. It felt like the opposite. It felt like saying, no, this is just what it is. You can believe it or you cannot believe it, but what you don't get to do is ask me to perform 
my pain for your judgment. So when I did that and when I kept those faces kind of blank in that way, it let me do that without exhausting myself emotionally. Does that make sense? Like you have, like you have a lot more bandwidth then to just say the things that you need to say because you're not performing something for people that don't want to hear it in the first place. Um, in terms of getting published, it was not hard to get someone to, to buy the book. It was hard to get the right eyes on it, which is something that people of color face a lot in the industry, or actually anybody from a marginalized community will face a lot because um, the, same, the same editors read the same work, have the same idea of what good work is. And what I really wanted was somebody to be in conversation with me and be fighting me in this book so that I could get the best book out. My first editor had really good intentions, but his way of interacting with me was, I think I'm a white man and I should probably get out of your way, so you just write what you need to write. That's not, that's not what somebody like me needs. Somebody like me needs somebody in the, in the ring with me, in the conversation with me. Finding that person was a little bit difficult, but I knew once I found him, I understood that I was gonna make the book that I wanted to make. These are great questions, thanks. Who else? I can't see very well. Back there? Okay. Oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. Um, which conversation? Like, which one are you talking about? About the publishing or about racism? Oh, so that's not one conversation. That's like 7,000, right? Um, but I don't trust other people to have that conversation. My parents, with all of their good intentions, I think they thought it would scare me. What scared me was thinking that I was going crazy because things were happening that I couldn't explain. Um, my son presents as brown, so and he's now 6'1". Um, I know, uh, <laughs> like, um, and he's treated like, a, like most people of color when they present as adults, he's treated like he's 25 when he's walking around New York now. He gets a lot, right? There's a lot that comes at him. Um, there's a lot of people that are wary of him. Um, they say things to him. And he, I think because we've had those conversations, he knows where they're coming from. It doesn't mean it hurts less. It does mean that when he comes home and tells me, I believe him right away. Um, the, the thing that's been really important is for both of us to bring my husband in on those conversations so it's not just the brown people talking to the brown people. Um, to bring my partner in and say, look, this is what he's facing and this is what it looks like. Wait, I'm going to tell you this crazy thing that happened. This actually kind of amazing slash crazy thing happened, which is, uh, so he was in seventh grade. And he was on the playground. Okay, he's my kid, so he's like up on, on a lot of like, what, what are the dynamics of humans and how do they work? We talk about that all the time. And he was playing, and I think they were playing, they were like still like in the beginning of seventh grade, so they were just young enough that they were still sort of playing tag. And one of the girls in the playground was like, why is it always separate into boys and girls? And he was like, ah, oh, you know, it's sexism. It's just, it's in the air. It's like, it's just what happens. Like, we don't mean to, but that's how the system works. And she was like, okay. And he's like, yeah, it's like racism. It's like, why, why all white people are racist? And that's just, it. and she was like, what did you say? And he's like, well, no, it's because that's how racism works, right? Like, if you're white in America, you're, you're racist unless you're really trying not to be but the system is inherently racist. So, and she's like, wait, what did you say to me? And then he was surrounded by a group of white kids that then threatened to beat his ass. And then what was scary, I think, for him is that the three kids of color that were there too also threatened to kick his ass. I find this out because I'm at home and I'm like writing away and he calls me, he's like, uh, mom, I said the thing about how racism in America works and nobody likes it. I was like, oh yeah, they don't like that. Like, don't say that. You don't need to, like, you don't need to. And I was like, what'd you say? And he's like, on the playground. I was like, yeah, also not a great place to, like, yell that out. If we're going to have these conversations, you got to kind of sit down and everyone's got to be ready for it. And he's like, they're, they're really angry with me. And I said, we'll come home, have some tea. Like, we'll, we'll be okay. I didn't understand. He got home. His school is, like, five blocks away. He got home in two minutes. So kid was running. And I opened the door and he, like, fell apart. And that's when I understood that they had surrounded him. They said they were going to kill him. They said that then they, there was all these texts coming in that we're going to, 
beat your ass at a time and place of our choosing. We're going to make sure you're humiliated the way you humiliated us. It was ugly. I was really terrified as a parent. I will just say, I was like, this is, this is where it all goes south because now this has happened and now his teacher is going to get really upset and say, why did you say that? Um, why would you say that? That's such a huge generalization. Um, why would you ever put that out there? And so I wrote to his teacher preemptively. I saw these texts coming in. The scariest one was, um, we, there was one from these girls that said, we think that maybe somebody in your house is giving you bad information and maybe you don't actually believe the things you say. So if you can just tell us you didn't mean anything that you said, then we'll make sure that nobody hurts you. It was that scary. And he said, mom, what does that mean? And I was like, babe, they know I'm your parent. Like they know what they're, I was like, they, what, do you wanna know what that is? And I was like, that's not, that's not, seventh graders aren't evil. That's not evil. That is people feeling really scared you said something that really hurt them. It hurt their heart, and they want to hurt yours back. And the easiest way to hurt your heart is to make sure that you no longer can believe what your mother tells you. That's pretty scary. Um, I wrote his teacher, and I will just say, I wrote her this thing, and I was like, look, I'm the person that says this. I was talking about systemic, like, systemic racism and the way it works. I will stand by that. I do a lot of thinking about this. I know that the school might not feel the same way. That's okay, but I hope when we talk about this, we can talk about more than just the white kids hurt feelings. Okay, I write that, and then I get back this letter that I swear to God, like every time, I, I keep it. I read it sometimes because she wrote back, and she was like, so glad you told me this. If we're going to call ourselves an anti-racist school, and I was like, wait, we call ourselves an anti-racist school? And she's like, if we're going to call ourselves an anti-racist school, this is actually a great point for us to have a conversation. So we're going to talk to the kids about what happened. And she said, I wonder if those white kids, when they were surrounding him and telling him that they were going to beat his ass, if they understood like what they were doing in that moment. Because I, and she's like, I'm willing to bet those are the same kids that are so upset about being called racist. And that's their response. We need to talk about why that's the response. They did. And they talked about it. And I'm not saying that like in a Shangri-La way, like it was, it was hard, it was weird. I'm sure some of those kids still hate me. I'm sure some of those kids still hate him. But it was such a, it was such a moment of um, relief for me that people knew how to have this conversation and that they were interested in it, right? That it wasn't just, I think, I think it's a pretty normal thing if you feel shame to be like, I feel shame, I'm shutting down, I no longer want to have this conversation, right? Or to be like, that's not true. I was really so relieved that they were not there. I spent my whole life with people that were in that place and it was so, it was such a relief for me that people were in a different place and willing to teach differently. I find that astonishing and also exactly right. Sorry, that was a really long answer. I had feelings. <laughs> Who else? Yeah, back here. Letter, yeah. Did he? Yeah, for sure. I read it to him before I put it up. I don't know if he's read it recently. I do know that when he was um, when he was twelve, we were at the publishers, and I was like, you know, I mean, he'll probably read the book next year. He's like, oh, mom, I one hundred percent already read the book. And I was like, you did? And he's like, yeah, I know all about the naked and the drugs. And I was like, okay, thanks, great. That's fun. Um, so that letter, I had to write that letter 19 times. I couldn't get it right. I really couldn't get it right. And I'll tell you why. I was so angry at my in-laws that every version of it I wrote was just, it was like, I didn't know I was doing it, but it was like trying to like jab them but it's through a letter to my son. And thank God I have trusted readers. I wrote it the 18th time. I was like, well, this has just got to be it. And it's got to be fine. It's got to be done. The book is due. And I gave it to my readers and they read the book and then they read that letter and they're like, so the book is great. What the fuck with the letter, Mira? What is this letter? And I was like, what, what, what do you mean? It's a good letter, right? And they're like, no, what's happening here? And I said, I'm just so angry. And they're like, it's a letter to your son. What do you want to tell your son? Just write it to your son. You don't have to worry. This is not for them. It doesn't need to be for them. It can just be to him. 
And then I wrote the 19th version, and that's the version that's in the book. It was such a relief to hear that, to be like, oh, I just get to write for him. I don't have to solve, you know, I, again, I didn't solve racism. So, like, I don't have to solve racism to end this book. I don't have to make my in-laws into someone they're never going to be. I don't even have to try. I can just write to my son. Um, but that's how that letter happened. Um, I don't know if he's read it lately. Should I make him? Okay. Yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys are like, no, no. All right, I'm, I generally don't make him do stuff. Oh. Thank you. All right, well, maybe maybe one day when he makes me feel really bad, I'll be like, read this letter. I wrote it to you. This is love. No, okay. Um, who else? I feel like I saw another question. Second row, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Yep. No, not being aware of it is not all the change that's needed. Thank you for asking that question. So we're talking about a chapter in specific where um, my boyfriend at the time was black and his friend was in the car with us and I assumed it was, there's a, you, you'll see there's like a diagram of my brain and it's just basically every racist trope you can think of piled into and anything that I actually knew about this kid, somehow there was a roadblock between me understanding what I actually knew and there was this whole way in which my brain put together every, every kind of bad stereotype that was possible and, and decided I was also gonna be weirdly like a white savior, brown savior, that thing. It is not, it was never enough for me to just know in that moment. The reason that moment is in there is because I woke up for 33 years and probably still occasionally remembering that. The reason that moment also is there is because I have had happen to me what I did to that boy in that car. I know, you know what, we had all been so beautiful the moment before. We were like on our way to prom. Everyone felt so, awesome. you know what I mean? We're just like looking so good. And when I said that, it just punctured that night. And the worst part of it was looking in the rearview mirror and seeing the look in his eyes and knowing exactly what he was feeling because I had, I had felt that. And I was like, oh, I just did that to him. It's never easy when you have completely negated someone's humanity with your own ignorance. And the only way to not do it, honestly, is to do a lot of research and to figure your stuff out. But I will say that's a constant process for me. That's not ever going to be a fixed thing. I will bet you, I've said this before, but I'll bet you there's going to be parts of that book that in five years when we get to another point, as God willing, by the way, when we get to another inflection point in a society that's smarter, that's more caring, that understands these things, there are going to be things in that book that people are like, can you believe this jerk said this? And I hope that would be true because that means we're evolving. That means that even the things that I thought were smart or open-minded or whatever, human, could have could have done with some good course correction but that's learning like for my whole life and that's that's just the job i think of being a human on the planet is to always keep learning what it is you don't know and trying to get beyond that thank you for that question um okay uh, right above them there's two of you in that <laughs> Mm -hmm. mm. with them yeah. mm -hmm. um so this is the this is the part that's always kind of hard for people i think because does anyone have a family that they're struggling with racial like a racial divide or a, a divide around your gender or a divide where you're like oh they're never going to understand this part of me so you try to talk to them and it's like you're like i can't yeah okay so i know where that wound is that's a very deep and hard wound to live with and whenever I'm asked this question I always feel like it's a little bit like people are reading the tea leaves into us like how did that family work out if they really like discussed it was it better okay spoiler no it didn't they didn't read this and change their minds about anything um they didn't read this and decide that they were wrong to support Trump they went right back out with their signs they stayed uh, you know heavily um on that side of things. And my father-in-law died the year this book came out in November, which was really rough um, for, because we had had a, you know, because also this is somebody that I love who died. 
And that was the most complicated part of writing this book, is that I don't hate them. And I, and I think that there's a, there's a sort of tendency of people to believe that racism is hate. Those are the same things. But actually, the most painful racist things that have happened to me have happened to me from people I love. And so carrying that and putting that into something felt really important to me. They um, read the book, and I said, if you would like to discuss anything, I'm happy to discuss it with you. And they didn't want to. And that was sort of an answer in and of itself. Um, and then now in 2020, um, my mother-in-law is uh, dating a man who won't let her watch Fox News, so some things have gotten a lot better. Um, no, but you know, life is long, and those things, those, those distances are really hard. They're so hard for all of us. Like when I said that and you guys raised your hands, I just feel so much um, empathy for how hard it is, sympathy for how hard it is for all of us who hold that and hold those kind of that divide, that feeling of like, I will never be sewn back together. I also have that divide in me, the place that will never be healed now, because that, that relationship will never change and that pain will always be there. My partner carries it, right? My son has started to figure out a little bit more about it. Um, it's always been important for me that he have a relationship with his grandparents. So I never said, no, don't see those people. I said, no, they're complicated. It's going to be complicated. You're going to hear some weird stuff. Some of it might make you feel funny about yourself. Bring it to me if it does. But that's where we are now. We're just living through a really complicated moment. Yeah, thanks. OK, the person right next to her, and then I'll go over here. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Did I discuss January 6th with my son and how did those conversations go? Yes, I did. Um, and we were watching it together. I was teaching and we were watching it together. And I think it was um, hard because we had been telling him this is what we're scared of. And his grandparents had said several times, this is paranoia, this is ridiculous, nothing like that would ever happen. So when it happened, one of the conversations I have with him a lot is you always have to talk to the people who are most on the edges of being hurt because they will see it coming faster. They know before you do. You have to trust them. Even if it's pain that you yourself haven't experienced, you have to trust someone when they say they're experiencing it. You have to trust them when they say it's coming for us because they know and we knew. So it wasn't, I wasn't surprised by what happened on January 6th. And I think I was heartbroken. And I explained to him, this is what we were so scared of. Um, real quick, is there anyone on that side of the room with questions? Because I feel like you're far away. Yeah, tell me. Yeah, so the question is, did I get permission from my in-laws in India to write the book? Absolutely not. Um, my in-laws in India, or sorry, my, my family in India, they're not they're hilarious, they're funny, they love me. Also, I am an anomaly to them, and if it were their way, I would be a very different person. I think that they find me embarrassing. I think the idea that I put my sexuality into a book is just like, what? You know, I think the idea that I actually and specifically drew myself naked for other South Asian women because of the way that we're taught about sex and because I wanted them to know, like, yeah, I got a body too, it's a thing. Um, you can have yours. We can be here like everyone else. And, um, and I think that was really hard for them. I think, they, I think they feel a certain amount of shame about my life. And I'm not going to take that on for them, but I'm also not asking them for permission to be myself. Yeah. And I do know that it's rough. Was there anyone else on this side? Yeah. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. How did you feel when you read it? How did you feel when you saw that? How did you feel?
Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good, that's a very good idea. So one of the things I'll just say, there's not um, a right answer to that. You know, do you guys ever, does anyone ever, like when your heart is broken, like all you can do is read poetry or listen to music? Does anyone like that? I'm one of those people. Yes, okay, I'm seeing some nodding people. I think there's a reason for that. I think there's a reason that we reach for certain art forms at certain times um, and we can't take in, we have to take things in a different way. Part of the reason that I drew this book is because I think there are things that happen that are just transcendent in the act of looking at lines and looking at how things are drawn. So when you notice that the galaxy is pressing through the bodies, you're going to feel something about it that's different. It's not, I'm not going to define what that is for you, but I know you felt that in your body. I felt it in my body when I was drawing it. That's all I'm trying for, right? I just want you to feel how that lives in you a little differently. Thank you. That's a great question. Okay. Yes, here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What do I think of the time now? Okay. So, the question is I'm going to say it back to you. And you guys help me if I didn't get it right. Did you grow up feeling isolated and apart from people? And then when I look back on it now, what do I think of that time? What did I do right or wrong in that time? Okay, so I will tell you the one thing, I did feel isolated, I did feel alone, I felt like a freak. I think a lot of people, I think more of us feel like freaks than not, to be honest. I mean, I'm sort of convinced of this. I feel like all of us feel like inside we're like, you know, um, messy and not understood. I think, and I, I feel like a lot of us have that. One thing, and I, some, I think some people are better at hiding it than others, um, one thing that that always enabled me to do, which is a real um, bonus, which I didn't know at the time, is that it really made me into my own person um, because nobody approved of me along the way. And so if you're only doing things really for your own approval, you kind of get to be a, a solid force on your own. That was an upside of it. It was extremely lonely. The thing that I did, though, and the way that I made it through, and this is huge, is I found my people. You always have your people. It might not be the people that you're looking at and you think I want to, like, you find your people. My community, I wrote this book. My friend Caitlin said this thing when I got really scared. I wrote this book and I was terrified of writing this book. I broke down a million times when I was writing this book and I was like, ah, America's going to hate me. Um, what do we do with the wall of hate? And now I'm just saying, like, here, give it to me. And she said, write it for us, though. Write for us. And that us isn't a consensus box. And you wouldn't be able to just point and say, that's my us. It's us, though. You know we're here. All of us that live in this complexity. All of us that live with this insecurity. And so that thing is the thing I did right, was finding my people. And my people are not defined in a census box way. It's the people that are questioning things the same way I am and are holding that space for me, right? Like, that's, that's the part that helps. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Yeah, in the very back? Did I have blanks in my mind? Oh, writer's block. Okay. I didn't have, thank you. No, that's helpful. Um, like, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah, okay. So I didn't have that. What I had was this, I had a tremendous uh, knowledge deficit. I didn't know how to draw well. I didn't know how to make certain things. I'd never made a font before in my life. It was just, that was more what I was dealing with. Writer's block was not a problem with this specific book, but do you want me to give you like writer's block advice? Okay, so because I do, I do get that sometimes. So I think what I would say about writer's block is usually it happens when you're facing a blank page. And the thing to do is actually write anything in that moment. It doesn't matter if it's good or not. It's easier to go into a page that has something on it and change it into the thing it needs to be than to walk away from that page and let the blankness loom over you. The other thing that really helps writer's block and really helps writing in general is if you um, have a certain level of intimacy with your writing. What I mean by that is 
when you're writing a lot and then you go away from writing, you can get scared of it. It becomes a monster again. It comes this huge thing. And then you're like, ah, it's got to be better than ever for me to get back in. That's a really scary place for me to be. So I try to stay in conversation with my writing. And so what that means is I've got to write a few times a week in order to feel like I'm myself, in order to feel like I'm not going to have that happen. Does that help? Does that make sense? OK. <laughs> um, we have time for one more. Oh my goodness. Okay, that wow, that was really generous. By the way, there's one person raising their hand and their friend just pointed to them who also was raising their hand. That's a good that's a good friend. All right. Yeah. Yeah, another great question. Okay, here's, here's how I made this happen. First of all, I didn't know I was writing a memoir. My um, editor and publicist came up with that subtitle, A Memoir on Conversations, and I was like, oh, no, because I thought I was just writing a bunch of funny conversations that then got really dark, and that somehow Mira Jacob, Funny Conversations That Then Got Dark, was not really a subtitle. Um, but what I will say is I wrote probably 80 conversations. How many are in the book? 40 something, I think. What I did when I was done with those conversations is I wrote them and then I had to do this check, which is, did you write this for clarity or vindication? Each one of them. And that to me is the key of writing a memoir. Are you writing for clarity or for vindication? Have you guys ever gotten in a fight with someone and then you just want to write about it or like you want to tell someone about it and you want them to be like, you're totally right, right? If you do that in a memoir, it's just a terrible memoir. Um, but the other thing that happens, the reason why it's a terrible memoir, actually, there's a reason. Um, have you guys ever been on the other end of that, where like somebody's telling you about a fight, and then you're like, that's really one-sided. That seems a little one-sided, right? You, because you're not holding yourself to the same standard that you're holding the person that you're in an argument with, you have to be able to do that thing specifically, which is to put yourself, to take yourself to task as much as you will take anyone else to task in the, in the writing. Right. So to do that, for me, the question is, did I write this for clarity? Did I write this because I want to understand my own humanity? I want to understand your humanity. I want to understand what we're dealing with here. Or did I write this because I want all of America to be like, yeah, your in-laws are really mean. And if it was that, if it was the, I, for vindication, I just cut those chapters out. Because the truth is, it actually isn't going to make me feel OK if people attack my in-laws. I love them. I'm so sad that this is where our relationship has gotten but I love them. So that's to me the that's how to write. For me, that's the that's the kind of key in writing memoir is asking yourself that question. Okay, is that it? Okay, thank you guys so much. Thank you for all your questions.